this is Gina Lazenby and uh, I'm at the home today of Stephanie Dowrick who is best-selling author. She's had a dozen books published and five of them have been number one bestsellers. And you've always been in the publishing world. You didn't you start the women's press in, way back in the 1970s? I did. I did. I've been working in, in book publishing or in writing for uh, more than 30 years. And I think I've been particularly lucky because the areas of work that I focused on, which is basically the human and spiritual condition, um, it's just a, a bottomless pit of interest. Mm -hmm. You know, so my whole writing life has been a process of self-discovery and discovery of others and a discovery of what this is all about, you know, why life matters. And you're an interfaith minister as well. I am. I'm an interfaith minister because I believe life does matter. And I believe that the spiritual dimensions of life uh, really teach us that more than anything else. Uh, maybe a, a psychological understanding also demonstrates to us how much life matters and how strongly we can influence circumstances, even when things are not going particularly well. Now, when you had one of your book launches back in November, you had a conversation with Christina Keneally, didn't you? I did. Who was then the Premier of New South Wales. And I went along to that. Father Michael Whelan yes. was interviewing both of you. And at the beginning of the talk, I, I thought, because when I travel, I can't buy books. And I thought, I won't buy a book. And I thought, I've got to buy a book. So I went and bought a book, because everybody was saying how great it was. And I owned it, and I thought, identity, that's a conversation for me now. So I owned it at identity and flick through, and I underlined this little piece here. I'm very excited to see how much um, you've <laughs> underlined. I'm always absolutely thrilled when people underline in my books, because I think I they've taken it, and now they're having their own intimate conversation with these same questions. I am thrilled when I see a book like that, <laughs> Gina. Well, I was impressed that Christina Keneally had annotations yeah. all um, over the book, didn't she? That's right. So I underline this, and it's identity emerges through a confluence of stories. And you know what was so interesting? Uh, Father Michael opened the book, and the first thing he did was he went to the same passage, the same line, and I thought, well, that is spooky, that's interesting. <laughs> so I knew it was a message for me that evening. Okay. <laughs> so okay. I was really, so speak to that, because about the power of our story. I, I will, actually, because I think when one of the great catalysts for transition, and I know that's what interests you very much, one of the great catalysts for transition is when your stories are worn out, mm. when they're no longer working for you, when you bored yourself to death with them, and you probably bored everybody else to death long yeah. before, and you suddenly realise really your stories are kind of an amalgam of interpretation. And where is that interpretation coming from? Is it coming from a hopeful place or is it coming from a place of self-pity? Is it coming from a place of creativity and promise or is it coming from a place of kind of contraction and bitterness? Mm. Uh, you know, we, we see the world, I mean, this is a very, this is a very common spiritual teaching, common to all the, all the traditions. We see the world not as it is, but as we are. And it's the same with our stories. You know, why is, it that, why is it that a person retells one particular incident over and over again? Well, partly it's that they may be condemned like the ancient mariner to retell the same story because they don't actually know how to listen to it. Or it may be that it's, it, it suits or fits a version of themselves that actually they've outgrown or that they're inhibiting themselves from outgrowing. So this whole question of the stories that we pay attention to and what they do to us, the stories that we tell, how we listen to other people's stories, how we grow from these stories is absolutely central to this question of ident identity. And one of the ways in which we can really tease out what we think our identity is, is to understand much more deeply what we are identifying with. Are we identifying with how hopeless we are, or yeah. are we identifying with those kinder moments, those more, those richer moments, those more promising moments that will sustain us even in the presence of suffering? Mm -hmm. And I think that it's a wonderful thing when a woman or a man or anyone at all, a child, says, you know, 
I'm tired of that story. Yeah, tell me a new story. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you a new story about myself. And it's not just a question of being a Pollyanna or reframing, to use a psychological term. It's really much more a question of which strengths am I watering with my attention as I tell these stories, or which inhibitions am I watering with my attention as I tell the story. And once we recognize that, we also recognize how much power we have to move forward in the ways that we really want to. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. And you also talked in there about the reverence that we have when we listen to other people's stories and kind of bear witness to them, especially when they're empowering stories. And I think that's one of the things I've noticed in the women's circles that I've hosted is where you know, when women come forward and they share and they're heard and it kind of, it really supports them when they're sharing a positive story and if there's a, there's a challenging story and then we hear it and we witness it and we support them in moving on from that, from the identifi identification with something that's negative. But I think it's important that we hear each other and really listen, isn't it? It's very important that we hear each other. It's also really important that we hear ourselves because many people are telling the same story without understanding or without perceiving what it is that they're saying. So when people learn to listen to themselves and really understand what it is that they're conveying, that is also a liberation. Mm. Compassionate listening self. Also. And what does that take to listening? How would you advise somebody to be more present and listen to themselves? Well, one thing is to be patient. The other thing is not to be interrupting yourself. And the other is simply to observe the patterns. If you're learning to listen to yourself, to observe the patterns of what you're bringing forward mm -hmm. and really to understand what the understory is, what the subtext is, what the intention is, and what you are ideally hoping for the listener. Because maybe that is a quality also that you need to give to yourself. It's interesting, I've noticed, uh, I've noticed quite a few women sharing that they feel um, they want to take time out from being social, they want more time to themselves yes. and not do things and really give presence to being. And that's the space, isn't it, where we can listen and we just, yeah. the TV isn't on, the radio's not on, we're not out talking to friends, we're not having, we're still doing that but we're doing less of it and we're giving more space to ourselves. And another thing is that I wrote a book called Creative Journal Writing. In the journal I teach, you can regard the journal as a place where you can learn what your patterns are of self-expression. You can discover which story you're constantly returning to. You can discover which are the strengths that are supporting you or what is holding you back. I mean, the journal, if you use it as it can be used, yeah. is also an incredibly rich way to learn to listen to yourself and to take the burden from others of listening to you yes. in ways that aren't really very helpful. Yeah. You know, so there are times in our lives where we just simply want to have you know, lots of very exciting, stimulating, quite superficial chatter. But if we never go to the place of the deepest things, then we starve ourselves. So the journal, and the deep kind of circle conversation that you're talking about, and also the conversation that reading a book allows, mm. all of that brings the balance back so that we can enjoy the, you know, the, the zany, the wild, the, the, the impetuous, but we can also have a quieter place of listening and the consolations that come from it. Thank you so much. Thank That's you, Jean. Really right? Thank you. It's great. And here's the book. And do make sure that you have time for sacredness in your life. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching.